That is fantastic. And again, I think the, uh, the thing that we're seeing in, in digital health and what we're about to hear now from Professor Katane uh, uh, from Columbia Medical Center uh, now talks about the, the use of digital in cardiovascular care. And uh, as one of the leading researchers at Columbia Medical Center and a professor of cardiovascular medicine at Columbia, uh, he is one of the folks who is doing a ton of studies uh, again, around heart disease and seeing where the, the opportunities for digital technologies to be adopted are, but also some of the obstacles. And uh, obviously doing so many different FDA studies, he's able to understand where the, uh, the agency, the FDA, is actually uh, providing more leeway or asking for more digital biomarkers in the studies, whether it's medication adherence through smart medication packaging, or whether it's using more real world data with home blood pressure kits, home scales, and things like that, activity monitors, to understand how and where uh, digital can lead to better data, uh, either in a phase three A or B, or in a phase four post-marketing study. So with that, uh, please welcome Dr. Katrani. Well, thanks so much. Uh, it's a real honor to be here and super impressed with the program so far. And I'm a clinical doctor, so we'll keep this relatively straightforward and based on uh, clinical medicine and talk a little bit about hypertension. And so at the very end of this talk, even if you've learned nothing about digital health, at least you'll know something about blood pressure, which we can all take home to either ourselves or our parents or someone else like that. Um, so if I can get my slides up, um, that would be great. Uh, perfect. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is blood pressure as a model for where we can really benefit from the use of digital health. I have a variety of um, industry-based uh, grant support uh, for the trials that we do, and I just want to cre credit one of my colleagues, Naomi Fisher from Boston, for a lot of the concepts and slides that I'm using in this talk. So just to start off with, I don't think I have to convince people that much about blood pressure control and how important it is in terms of reducing cardiovascular events. Just simple increases in blood pressure dramatically improve, increase cardiovascular mortality. Now, I don't know if any of you were following the U.S. Uh, World Cup game, but that was actually going on and it just ended. I think the U.S. just won. But um, the other reason that blood pressure is important is that it's episodic. And this is just an example of a paper published in the New England Journal of what happened in Germany during uh, the World Cup games. And the red spikes are all the German games. And on the y-axis are admissions to the hospital for cardiovascular events. So you can see there's a pretty clear correlation there. It's problematic. And so this is something where a lot of patients come to see me in the office and their blood pressure may be fine, but uh, where it's elevated and they say, well, that's just because you're wearing a white coat. Well, the reality is, is I'd like to think that I'm a lot less nerve wracking than the cab driver who cuts you off when you're trying to hail a cab or trying to cross the street right here. And so at home, blood pressure is spiking all the time. And so it's really important to get measurements of blood pressure beyond the office. And simple decreases in blood pressure, just two millimeters of mercury, if I were able to do that in all of my clinic patients in the hospital, I would reduce their stroke and cardiovascular mortality by five to 10%. These are whopping drops in terms of um, uh, public health outcomes, especially considering how prevalent hypertension is. Despite the fact that medicines are generic, despite the fact that in areas like this, access to care is very, very good, we see that rates of blood pressure control are awful. On the left of the slide is blood pressure control among patients with hypertension, and it's language, despite the fact that we have all these tools and on patients and doctors to see them. The idea here is that less than 60% of patients have their blood pressure controlled, and even those who are on medicines, it's still pretty terrible as a whole. So here's a good example of why that is. So this is just a patient that Naomi saw up in Boston who came in to see her. And just so you know, it's a center and level set. Blood pressure should be 120 over 80 and at most 130 over 85 or so. So the patient seen it and had a blood pressure of 144 over 92. And at the time, uh, Fenway traffic was busy as the Sox unfortunately beat the Yankees. So the patient didn't want anything to be done because he said it was because of the Red Sox. Two weeks later, the, the Red Sox won and the blood pressure was still elevated in the office when she saw him. She said, come back in two weeks, your blood pressure is still elevated. He says, oh, it's no, it's because the Sox won the series. Then after that, the next time the patient was seen, the blood pressure was elevated, but he was having arthritis pain. And then the elevator was broken, so he took the stairs. And it's excuse after excuse. And blood pressure is called the silent killer because nobody feels these symptoms attributable to blood pressure. But yet 10 years down the line with untreated blood pressure, cardiovascular events are accruing. 
And this entire saga goes on and on. Finally, he agrees to take uh, a prescription of no more salt. He, three months later, joining a gym. And you don't know how much time has elapsed for this patient who's coming to the office repeatedly. Think about the ones that don't even come to the office and what happens with their blood pressure over time and their side effects associated with them. Now, the other part of this is that there's differences in perception of what we as physicians do and what our patients do. So on the left is the doctor who says, just take these medicines I prescribe, uses an antiquated, many of you may not even know what this, this is from, Wayne's World. This is all good. The patient's going to be treated for blood pressure. And the patient's perception of what's going on is very, very different. Why am I taking all these pills? I go to Dr. Google online. There's a million side effects associated with them. I don't want to take them, and I'm not going to take them. And so we have to come out of this outmoded view and actually see the adherence piece of this and talk to patients about why it's important to take medicines for a condition that they don't even feel. And if you look at this published data, it's really bad. 50% of patients stop taking their blood pressure medicines within a year. And this is people that we just assume are on it because every time we look at the EMR, we say they're on the medicine, fine, check, but they're not even taking it. If you actually measure adherence testing for people with elevated blood pressure, you actually look at the urine of these patients, less than half of patients are actually taking the medicines that we prescribe them. I know for a fact that if I write a prescription, probably not me because I'm a better doctor than this, but many people, my students, if they write a prescription, the likelihood that someone actually fills the prescription is two and three, and the likelihood that they take it as prescribed, even for a once a day medicine, is two and three. So if you multiply those two together, you get about 50% adherence to medicines we prescribe. And as physicians, we need to come to grips with that and do better for our patients and then for our populations in clinic. Even in the context of clinical trials, the SPRINT trial was a trial that many of you may have heard about. It was in the news looking at control of blood pressure intensively versus conventional control of blood pressure. And what they showed is actually a reduction in cardiovascular events. It wasn't just a reduction in blood pressure. But the sobering part of the SPRINT trial is that when patients stop being in the trial and they just went back to their normal routines, at 10 years, their blood pressure had drifted back to where it was when they started the trial. These are patients that were initially enrolled in the intensive arm who knew that they were going to get cardiovascular benefits from having their blood pressure better controlled. So that's a problem. So what do we do about this? Well, we've heard a lot about digital health and ways we can monitor blood pressure at home. And I'll talk to you a little bit about two sort of aspects of this. One aspect is sort of what we know. One aspect is more experimental and what we could do. So on the left is digital health. On the right, these are kidneys. There's a way to actually treat the kidneys to reduce blood pressure. So first, how about taking care to the patients? There's a really important study that was published in the New England Journal by Ron Victor, who subsequently passed away, where um, he actually went into the black community and had barbershops be the ones administering care to patients. They brought pharmacists into barbershops and had the pharmacists talk to the patients within that specific location to lower blood pressure in that community. And what they found is that 60% of patients, 64% had control of their blood pressure versus just 12% in the regular education group. So this was important, but this is difficult to scale. So is there a way to do this digitally so people can be seen in their communities, perhaps by video or otherwise, to be able to get better control of blood pressure? That's something for its food for thought. Another thing that's being done is at the MGH Brigham system, and this was just published in JAMA Cardiology, which is why I'm showing it, because there's outcomes associated with it. Um, they basically did virtual health clinical visits by people who are volunteered out of college. This was done in conjunction with pharmacists, in conjunction with, um, with physicians as well. But the idea was is to take patients, give them home blood pressure cuffs, see them, have them look at them, monitor them, and then have an algorithm feed the readings to be able to control their blood pressure. And by doing this, what they actually showed is a significant reduction, statistically significant reduction in blood pressure compared to the usual care group. That's why I'm showing it, because normally we hear of these things as pipe dreams but without actual outcomes. And in this case, they were able to demonstrate good outcomes. Beyond that, and sort of to conclude before we take some questions, I'll talk about this technology, which will likely be approved in the next year or so uh, here in the United States. Most of you are probably not familiar with it, but there's actually ways that you can downregulate nervous signals from the kidneys by essentially zapping those nerves. Um, the nerves travel around the kidney arteries themselves. And what the device specifically will do, this device, there's other devices as well, heats up those nerves and deactivates their signaling. And that is an adherence independent way of controlling blood pressure. So instead of someone having to take a medicine every day, they have the procedure done, their blood pressure gets lowered as we've shown in sham control trials, and that allows um, uh, blood pressure to be lowered. 
But even within the context of these carefully conducted sham control trials, we observed an interesting phenomenon. So what we did is we measured pressures at home in the seven days prior to a follow-up clinic visit. And because this was an FDA-sponsored device, FDA um, under the auspices of the FDA device-based trial, we had patients come in every month and they had home blood pressure taken for seven days. Then they came in for their office visit, at which point we looked at their urine to see if their medicines were being taken and they knew this was happening. That was the office visit. And then we actually sent them home with a blood pressure monitor that did blood pressure every 12 to 20, every uh, sort of 30 minutes to an hour to then look at their ambulatory blood pressure. But importantly, they got this thing got placed in the office after they took medicines that we witnessed them taking in the office. So what do you think the results showed? What they basically showed is there was greater separation in the home blood pressures before they came in for their office visit when they were doing what they were doing. And actually at six months, while medicines were greater in the sham arm compared to the denervation arm, there was actually not much of a difference seen in the office. So what we're seeing in the office may not reflect what people are actually, actually doing at home, even in the context of a carefully controlled clinical trial. So to sort of conclude, I just wanted to use hypertension as a base case to give you an idea of where innovation is still uh, uh, sorely needed. We know that hypertension or high blood pressure is, uh, it should be easy to treat. I mean, this is not hard. They're generic medicines. They're super cheap. You can take them without any issues and access to care for certain things like this, even in geographies where it's good, shouldn't be an issue. And yet we're terrible at it. So we definitely need innovation to be able to help us. Where is the innovation needed? I think the most important thing I can tell you as a clinician that's been in practice for now 20 something years is that empowering the patients to be in charge of their own decision-making, having them actually see the blood pressure numbers and understanding what that risk is to them over time is game-changing in terms of their behavior. Uh, we see this across the board in cardiovascular disease. We'll see it with CAT scanning. When you look at heart arteries, if you see plaque, patients are motivated to do things. If you just tell them, we need to lower your risk, they're less motivated. So that's really important in terms of empowering patients. We have many digital health strategies to do it. Adherence is another real big issue. And even novel therapies, which aim to sort of short circuit this whole adherence pathway, this feedback pathway, such as denervating the renal nerves, still need digital health to be able to monitor their effectiveness in the outpatient setting. For that reason I mentioned before, that if you do that when you only monitor them, when they know when they're coming in to be monitored, the behavior is different than if they're truly at home in their element. So with that, I hope that was helpful to you in terms of talking about hypertension as a case study. I hope that there's a lot of investment in this area because we really need it. And from a population public health standpoint, there's nothing more gratifying than helping a large number of patients. So thanks so much for your time.